Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with UK-based jazz guitarist and composer Chris Montague. We caught up with him via Zoom in May 2020 to talk about quite a bit, like his latest 2020 CD, Warmer Than Blood. He was born in Gateshead, UK, and began playing guitar at a very early age. He is the founding member of Troika and has garnered a reputation for his distinctive approach to the guitar and has gained much acclaim for his contribution to great many contemporary recordings. Get to know him. Enjoy. Thanking you for being so patient from yesterday, and thanks for taking some time out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. It's um, you know, it, it really helps me with the the new album coming out and stuff like that to talk about it. So I, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, you bet, man. So let's start off here, and I want to know from you. You know, we're in this new, weird, surreal world of COVID nineteen. We've been quarantined for two plus months now. When did you start seeing gigs get canceled? When did you see the big domino fall and you knew this is it, jazz is going to be silent? Um, it was a, it was about the 20... I remember it was my birthday, which is the 22nd of March, and it was about then. I remember for my, for my birthday, I had like a load of like really nice gigs that got got iced from the diary, which was a bit... It felt like a bit of a, a punch in the guts. But, and, then, and, then they all, and then it became really obvious about two weeks in that we there's no way this is coming back to normal before i don't know i, I don't think before the winter i mean because i i, I kind of scrambled around like everyone else trying to rebook tours and trying to book dates with promoters and all that sort of stuff and and they they kind of they they they've all been amazing actually most of them have tried to rebook things and and honor those those dates with musicians and bands and things but I, I don't know I still don't know if it's going to actually come off in the end because my my, um, my partner she's a, a, fr- a freelance violinist in London with all the orchestras and things and um, th- th- I mean they're, they're, talk- they're talking about not going back to work until like early January and that kind of stuff so you do have a new album coming out you know and the interesting thing about talking to musicians is that there's always these interesting revelations one of the most interesting things someone told me was this there's going to be a special place for musicians that release brand new material during this time and you have an album warmer than blood coming out mm. talk to me a little bit about how bittersweet this is you can release an album during its time where people probably have the latitude to listen more but you can't follow it up with you know live performances yeah, I'm, I'm, I I did kind of kick it around with with Mike uh, Yanish, who runs the label Whirlwind. We discussed it a little bit at length, and I I was in two minds whether or not to do it or not. But I think it's been the right thing to do to have something to to focus you, and and also I I do think people have have been much more susceptible to listening to it. You know, it's definitely got caught the wind with the press a little bit more. Well, let's talk about your beginnings. How did you? get into jazz how did you know kind of where were you born and raised and how did jazz become a part of your life i was born in newcastle in the northeast of uh, of england and um I, and my parents weren't musical at all I, I didn't have a huge um musical kind of um family or anything like that but my, my mum and dad did have a really really good record collection um my dad had loads of like bb king and albert king records and um Elmore James and like loads of early blues stuff like Muddy Waters and and he got me really into Jimi Hendrix and stuff like that and then my mum had a lot of um like Chic and Brothers Johnson and like all this dance me- like funk music and stuff like that and um so I I would sit and learn all those different guitar parts all this funk music and dance stuff as well as all the kind of blues things and, and then I gradually realized that the bit I really liked the most in the records was when was when you know Hendrix would take a solo or BB King would take a solo, and that led me down the the, the, the sort of garden path with with the jazz thing because you know someone said, well in jazz you just get to solo all the time, and I thought that was amazing, so I I, I started to listen to that music when I was about probably about fifth, 14, 15, started to get into it, and and um, I I always kind of gigged from a very early age. There was a lot of like working men's clubs and stuff like that in the northeast. And um, I was quite lucky that a lot, like a lot of older musicians would would let me ha- kind of hang around and play with them and stuff, and and they would guide me to to a lot of um, a lot of really interesting music and interesting players and stuff that I would never have heard. And um, I, I just got into it that way and, and through the blues thing, and I got, I got into like Schofield and Mike Stern, and then I was into that jazz thing, and and I, I just wanted to learn as much as I could about being a jazz guitar player and learning all these new chords and 
like trying to learn all these new solos and play some bebop and that kind of stuff and and gradually i got more and more into writing my own music and, and more and more into um kind of more modern avant-garde kind of players and stuff like that and it, it just went from there and i went and studied music um in london and and I met a load of really good players there, and I've just been very, very, very fortunate that I've always there's always been people that want to play with me, and so I've always played in a lot of people's bands, and and also I've I've always um, written music and 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 released music initially with this uh, sort of first taste of that for me was a band called Troika, which was a trio with me, uh, Josh Blackmore on drums and, and Kit Downs on on keyboards and we we did a lot of recording and touring and stuff like that and and that, that kind of grew into its own little thing and, and it just you know it's the musician thing is so incestuous like everybody knows everyone and plays with everyone after a certain wh- amount of time you know you know it's interesting just at the beginning of the year i moved uh to a suburb out here in kansas city lee summit i'm in the hometown of papathini so that always tends to get everybody kind of cued into things so yeah uh, yeah yeah he's from there isn't he yeah yeah, yeah. So it's always wild, man. It's like it's almost like when you get a car and you recognize everybody with it. Now that everybody sees Lee Summit, they're like, "Oh, Pat Metheny." So it's been kind of a calling card lately, which is cool. But but Jim, uh, Ch- 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 Charlie Parker was from Kansas as well, wasn't he? Yep, he was from the heart of Kansas City. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's still clubs down there on 18 and Vine, so it's cool. It's uh, um, it, it's a good thing. So, did you spend some time with Charlie Watts? Oh, you know, I I just played one uh, one gig with him a, a while ago. Um, it was a it was when this the it was a really chance sort of thing, really, because this, this, the Rolling Stones were playing at Hyde Park in London, and um, they decided to um, to throw like a, a kind of a, a party afterwards, and and they, they just wanted to have a jam. So that it it was kind of like Charlie Watts turned up and. Um, um, Chuck Lavelle on piano turned up, and uh, Bernard the singer, and like a, a quite a, all the kind of spacking and singers, and 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 Charlie got up and played, and we we, we had to learn some some tunes. It was a, a saxophone player called Tim Reese, who plays with the Stones, and he's got like a pad of all the kind of Stones music arranged for jazz musicians. So whenever they turn up in town and they want to have a party, they they rent a theatre somewhere and and get um get a couple of bodies in to 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 fill out the the lack of Keith Richards and Mick Part, I suppose. And you, you just, we played all that music together. It was really fun because he's, he's a, um, he's very much into jazz drumming. He's, he's really, he really knows his, his stuff with that. And I remember chatting to him afterwards about Phil Seaman and all these drummers in, in London who he looked up to back in the sort of fifties and early sixties and things. And he's, he was, he's, he really had a lot of uh, passion for, for jazz and improvising, you know? You know, it's interesting. The reason why I bring Charlie up is because when he came to Kansas City, we have the American Jazz Museum down on 18 and Vine. And he came and he did a tour. And a lot of people, I think, don't under, maybe don't know that Charlie is a jazz enthusiast, like to his core. So that's why I was bringing him up because he really does dig the jazz arts for sure. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. And, you know, he, he, he supported a lot of people over the years because he had his big band for a while there and 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 he really he, he really that's where i think speaking to him it seemed to be where his his sort of passion was you know yeah yeah so you know we're going to get to the point where we get to the end of the covid 19 and we do play live what do you hope both the musicians and the audience realizes from this time away from live jazz um i i hope they i hope they come back with a, a renewed sense of um well, a, a hunger for it, you know, it's something that is in it was in people's lives, and, and I think we probably all took it for granted that we'd always be gigging and doing stuff. Um, but I, I just hope that the it, it kind of has the, a, a, a sense of appreciation f- that, that it is important. This stuff, you know, when you go and see somebody play in a venue and, and they're, they're taking risks and, and they're improvising and doing things that you won't ever hear again, you you, you have to be in a room with them to do that. I, I hope that has some currency. Because the, the kind of the live streaming thing, I just, I, it, I, it doesn't do it for me. I just, I don't, I, it's not that the people who are doing it aren't amazing. It's just, I don't, fe- I don't, I don't feel that kind of visceral connection with them when they're doing it, you know? And and I don't, I, I, I'd feel so self-conscious doing that from behind a, a, a screen, you know? It's just so, so sort of inevitably sterile for some reason, I don't know. But I, I, that thing of being in a room with people and, and doing something that only happens in that room that night is, is, 
it's quite a special thing you know I, I really miss it at the minute especially with all this you know this new music coming out that i can't play any, anywhere everyone has a perception of you your family your friends your fans but you're the one that's living your life who do you think you are oh my god jesus i don't know <laughs> 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 I, 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 I i i wouldn't take myself that seriously i mean i take what i do seriously and stuff like that but I don't know, you know, I've, I've got I've got my family and my, my little boy and, you know, I, I practice and write music and I, I do my gardening and stuff like that at the minute. And, you know, I, it, the good thing with this whole situation at the minute is that you kind of learn to just live in the moment, which I think for a long time I, I hadn't done. I was always worried about, well, oh, I've got this gig coming up, I've got to practice for that, I've got to do this, got to sort these parts out, got to, you know, all the kind of, all the kind of nonsense you have to do. But all of a sudden you've got this time on your hands and you, you can really focus on the important stuff and, and, and um, I've I've, I've kind of it's been a it's been a positive thing for me. I know I've had loads of loads of gigs and things cancelled, but you know it's you know they they'll come back. It's not going to go forever, and it 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 does give me a bit of perspective because for years I've been saying like oh Jesus Christ I can't keep doing this over and over again all the travelling and all that kind of stuff, and 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 now I'm like God I'd, I'd give anything to go and go somewhere and do a gig you know. Yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, at the end of the day, it's all life after all. We got to adapt. Everything changes. And, you know, when I think about artists, jazz artists are the most improv-oriented. It's almost as though this moment was made for jazz musicians because that's all you guys do. You do different things every single time you get on stage. And this is, the, right now, our reality is the ultimate act of improv. Yeah, everyone's making it up as they go along, and 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 being a jazz musician, it, I, I say this: it's always a, it's always a recession in in the jazz world. Do you know what I mean? So you, you, you most jazz musicians I know are, are really resourceful, um, energetic, creative people because they they do it on the spot, but they also do it with their career constantly trying to invent stuff. And you know, we we only we can, we only get to do gigs if we've got new music out or we're releasing something. So it's it's. I think it's. I think you're right. I think most jazz musicians have adapted to this really well, and there's loads of my friends have done like online recording uh, projects, which have been, it's been really, really fun to take part in. And like Kit, who Kit who plays piano in 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 my trio, he's um he's just released some music just was it just today actually. It's well worth checking out. He's got a SoundCloud link to it, um, Kit Downs, and but it's it was about, I think there was about nine people involved in it and doing it, and he you would just send the music and you would put a bit on and he would mix it in and that kind of stuff, and it sounds it sounds amazing, and it's been so much fun to do, but it would it wouldn't have happened all, all this new music that's been ma created and written and 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 recorded between people wouldn't have happened if if this situation hadn't have happened. Yeah, very true. That's the thing about jazz. You know, artists aren't getting into this for the money. I mean, this is a resourceful realm. I mean, even when bebop was getting invented, it wasn't because a label said, hey, we need to invent this new way of listening to music. It was just it, they musicians felt it and created it. Yeah, it sort of happens in, in spite of uh, in spite of other things. It happens in spite of all the adversity around it. And it, it, it happens anyways. And and it, it yeah people do you're right like people don't they don't get into this thinking they're going to be a millionaire but i mean it's it's also a myth that you you kind of you're starving all the time because it's, it's that's not true either you can it's it's still a profession you know you can still you can still look after yourself fairly well doing it so you know the one thing too i always ask musicians is <laughs> you know how healthy is jazz you know i mean jazz is one of those things where at the end of the day I want to know how healthy it is. And it took this virus for me to understand how healthy jazz really is. I mean, jazz is a, is a realm of music that at this point right now, with the amount of gigs that one person is canceled on, it's staggering. It's a hundred percent staggering. Does, do you ever think about that? Just with like, I mean, I mean, if I look at like Kansas city, for instance, or like London or something, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I don't think I ever have to ask that question again. Like, how healthy is jazz? I know how healthy it is because of this virus now. Mm. I think the the creative side of it is 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 very healthy. I think the the people's ability to adapt and do new new things with the music and and people are always coming up with new ways to play because it's it's still such a young art form. It's not it's it's really not that old compared to other things that surround it. You know, if you look at like the classical tradition or. Uh, 
uh, you know, what, what else is there? Like even like you know bluegrass music or something like that. It, it's it, old time music. It's that that has a much longer tradition than what jazz has, and it it it, it sort of came about partly, I think, because of the the new technology that came up at the same time, is it? Which meant that you could actually capture somebody doing something in the moment and record it and then sell it somewhere or send it around the world so i think it's it's people are still figuring out sort of what it is to a certain extent and i i just i i see it as a very very adaptable um skill set to have to be able to hear music and then do something to it or on top of it that is is new and i think that i agree i, I think that's a that's a really healthy part of it i just hope that the the outlet for it is it r remains healthy after this you know it's like it's 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 kind of I, I worry about the promoters and the venues as much as i do like my friends who are musicians who make this music you know because I, I think without those venues and without those promoters who are willing to take a chance on it and put on put on gigs and organize nights and things like it, it, where what what is the outlet for it where where do we play I, I think i've been reassured by some people especially in new york there's a lot of people that are donating money there's a lot of people giving money to all kinds of organizations. And I think that community is the big word that's going around right now. And I think that's very important. And I think it's time for people that need help to ask for it. And I think there's people out there that are willing to do it. So I think there's there's going to be a survival. There's going to be a Darwinian principle that goes into it. Yeah, no doubt. I, I, I don't think everyone will get through it. But I, but I think... Um... It, 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 it'll always carry on people will always always want to hear this and people will always make it you know you don't you sort of don't have a choice if if it, if it feels good to do to do anything else but make this sort of music Chris hey man thank you for opening up about your life and music and this very strange world we're living in I appreciate it no worries my, my pleasure Joe my pleasure so the, the album's out now on uh, Whirlwind Recordings. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in the UK, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Chris for his time, music, and stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Jazz.